So now you're here again knocking at my door A little too late for I'm sorry for The lights went out cause you kept cutting the cord And it started to fade into your grave See I finally opened up my eyes And I saw me coming back to life That I'd be better everyone good evening welcome to our webinar glad you have all made it i am john paul fitzpatrick but before i say anything else i am going to hand over to our leanne <laughs> hi everyone uh, my name is leanne mcguire as you can see in the screen so i am the chair of glasgow city parents group and there's probably some people joining tonight that have maybe never heard of Glasgow City Parents Group before. So just to quickly let you know, we are basically a, a group of parent volunteers. Um, there's 10 of us and we all have children in Glasgow schools. We work to basically be the voices of Glasgow parents across the city, hopefully and represent and support parents and carers um, in their child's learning journey. That's really it in a nutshell. Um, but tonight, obviously, we're collaborating with John, Paul and Cameron on this event. The event will be recorded, just to let you know. Um, through the event, uh, we want to encourage you all to get involved and chat back to us and let us know that you're out there and you're listening and we're not just talking to you thin air. <laughs> so please do use the chat function and uh, give us a wee hello. And um, just to let you know as well, everybody that signed up tonight, you'll automatically be added on to Glasgow City Parents Group's uh, mailing list. And that'll keep you up to date then with any other events that we've got coming up because we do actually run these kind of events very regularly online. So they're really easy to access and it's a whole host of different topics that we've got. We've got more coming next week as well. So I'll add you all onto the mailing list and if you find it's not useful to you, then you are free to unsubscribe at any time. So that's my intro. I'm just going to pass you straight on to John Paul and uh, I'll get my cue went and pop back in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant, Leanne. Thank you. And, you know, Leanne, you are doing amazing work on behalf of the city's parents. I'm in awe of you and your energy and your commitment and your passion. It's just, it's amazing to see. And if you're not already involved, with Leanne and the group, then you know now's the time to get involved because it's 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 so important that parents' voices are heard in these challenging times. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. My name's Dr. John Paul Fitzpatrick. If we're ever flying again on planes and the plane is in trouble and they ask if there's a doctor on board. Don't bother pressing your call bell. I am not that kind of doctor. It would end in tears. But I'm a doctor of education. I'm the founder of a company called Teach Mindset. I work across the country with staff teams, with school leaders, with parents, with pupils. And our focus is resilience, mindset, well-being, and helping people be the best that they can be. As Leanne was saying, we definitely want to hear from all of you tonight. So don't be shy. You've got the, the idea of how this works. You're all typing away in the chat box and we'll be saying a, a few shout outs in just a second. But before we start any of that, there is the more eagle-eyed of you will have noticed a third person in this wonderful trinity of Leanne and myself. We have the legend that is Mr. Cameron Fulton. Good evening, Cameron. Hello, how are we? <laughs> very good, thank you, sir. How are you? Yeah, very well. Firstly, I just want to echo what John Paul said, Leanne. Thank you so much for having JP and I here tonight. I think that everything that you guys are doing is tremendously important, especially in these difficult times. And 
Uh, it's 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 it, we were buzzing to hear that we obviously he's wanted to partner up. So thank you very much for for having us on. Um, and hello to everyone for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, we're looking forward to chatting and just helping as best we can tonight. Uh, obviously, we're going through a really tough time. I think it's unprecedented, isn't it, the word that we've been hearing all the time. I've had 50 pence every time somebody said that. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to tonight, and it's it's lovely to spend our evening together. Yeah, definitely, and thanks for that. And uh, keep your participation coming. We want to hear a massive shout-out from all of you tonight as we lean in and we connect with each other and we create a really positive space to consider our resilience, but also how to build it in our children. We're going to keep it really, really practical. And we want you guys to support and connect with each other, as we were saying in the chat function. So give us a big shout out. Say hello to us in the chat box. Let us know where you are and just let us know how you're doing tonight. A wee random bit of chat from you in the chat box right now and kicking things off we have got Catherine hello to Catherine we've got Tracy we've got Shaniqua I think I know Shaniqua we've got Gary we've got Jennifer we've got Sarah we've got so many of you jumping in if you're having problems with the audio don't worry we will have a recording of this tonight so we've got Kate Megahi or Megahi sorry from St Stephen's Hi, Kate. I was with the St. Stephen's Peoples today earlier. They were in fine form. We've got folk from Stonehaven. Good evening, Diane. I love Stonehaven. What an amazing part of the world. Yeah, We've got Sarah from Lawn Street Primary in here. We've got, We've got a few. Yeah, members on. I see the names. Real. We've got Tam on. We've got John on. We've got Sarah on. That's actually all part of Glasgow City Parents Group members. Yeah, yeah. nice. We're all here Welcome representing. <laughs> <laughs> and we've also got a random interloper, which is amazing, from North Ayrshire. The best things come from North Ayrshire, Jennifer Miller. I am biased because I come from Adrossan originally, but we've got you and you're from Kawinan Academy. Keep telling us who you are and where you are. We're loving your energy. We are absolutely loving it. Now, I've got... A wee bit of a step back in time uh, that I want you to go on a bit of a journey with me here. And I want you to think back to this point just about exactly a year ago. And consider how we were all feeling at that particular point in time. And actually consider what was your response to the news of coronavirus and all of the uncertainty that we were potentially facing. What was your response? And tell me truthfully, were you that person that cleaned out all day Lidl and Tesco of every rural and planet Earth <laughs> as we panic bought as much pasta as you possibly could? Leanne? Do you have a cupboard full of UHT milk or pasta or anything like that? A cupboard full of lurels? No, no, no. But I know an auntie who did. Uh, my daughter's auntie in the East End. And she was sending us a video of our lural towers. <laughs> <laughs> what I, I said at the time, because I was one of those ones that left it to the last minute that was mm, then to, to find mm. lural and had to drive to about 10 shops. <laughs> so I was actually threatening her through our video chat, saying, you're getting mugged tonight. I'm going to come round and I'm going to break into your house with your lural <laughs> <laughs> you know and it's, it's really interesting isn't it because even out of the three of us let alone everyone that's typing the responses in the chat box just now will all have had different responses to it some will have been about that panic and that absolute panic buying mm -hmm. some folk will have stuck their head in the sand, thinking this will blow over if I just ignore it. Are you ready for the worst possible joke that you'll ever hear? By denial, I don't mean the river in Egypt. I'm here all week, and probably next week, and potentially the week after. <laughs> Yeah, potentially. But 
Joking aside and flippancy aside, we've all got really, really different responses. And I want you to keep that in mind, team, that we're all very, very different. Because although we're all living under a common set of circumstances, there is lockdown. What has happened to us over this year has been very personal and has been very in individual for all of us. And just, I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your minds as we go through this. And in the chat box, let us know how this last year has been for you and share only what you're comfortable with sharing. And some of you are already doing that as well, different kind of worries. And I love the way you're supporting each other, but we've got worries about employment, and um, Lisa's reflecting that you felt that you didn't believe it, that it was mm -hmm. going to be exaggerated. And yeah, all of those kind of mixture of emotions. Um, and you've got a, a medically vulnerable child. So that must have been really, really challenging. Siobhan saying, you know, you thought that you wouldn't come to anything. Yeah, and it'd be over in a few weeks as well. And Kate, you're talking about the impact of the SQA exams and you've got an S6 with a conditional place at uni for medicine and no backup plan. So real worldly examples. Now think back to how you were feeling right at that initial point and consider how you're feeling right here, right now. And I'd be curious to know, has anything shifted for you? Are you and those around you more optimistic? or more anxious, or more worried, let us know in the chat box. Because what I'd like us to consider, and this is a bit deep for this time in a Thursday evening, people, is that relationship between our thoughts, our feelings, and our actual behaviours, what we are actually doing. So our thoughts, what we're feeling inside, and what we go on to do. Because there's not two of us on this session tonight that see the world through our same eyes. And that's worth keeping in mind. Now, I've got a bit of a question for all of you, but how many thoughts do you think that psychologists estimate that we have got going through our head every single day? From the minute you get up to the point where you pass out and sleep at night. I want your best guesses in the chat box. Let us know your guesses. What? How many thoughts? Take a wild guess and we'll see who nails this. And whilst you're typing all of that in, and Susan Johnson is right in there with 40,000. Susan, that is a very interesting guess. Some of you are sharing as well things that you are looking forward to. Ronnie, brilliant shout out from Cardonald. It's great and you're loving the energy so far. Yes, I think that's something the three of us absolutely have in common. We are the human equivalents of Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> Tam, you're jumping in there with 50,000. Gary, 60,000. Sarah Brown has said a number that I'm scared to pronounce because I a five from a standard grade maths, and I'm not entirely sure what that is. Fiona Rush, though, has put a comma in, which is helping me immensely, 100,000. Um, Angela, millions per minute. Siobhan, a billion thoughts. John, John 500 million. Did. So John works with me on the group. So oh, that's why amazing. John's put that probably in because he knows that's the speed that my brain works at. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> like, yeah. That's probably the amount of thoughts that I have just thinking about with Biscuit. I'm going to have him a cup of tea, to be honest. I'm that indecisive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Now, actually, a whole lot of folk there were buying on the money. Psychologists actually estimate there is somewhere between 50,000 and 80,000 thoughts going through our head every single day. Now, the reason that we're having this chat, and I promise you this is as deep as it gets tonight, because we will be talking about the practical things you can do and actually the things that you can do to help your children and young people and families as well. But if we've got 50 to 80,000 thoughts, passing through our heads like clouds, then us maybe recognising that some of those thoughts will make us feel absolutely brilliant. 
And some of those thoughts absolutely leave us feeling stressed, worried, anxious, depressed. But they all have one thing in common, these thoughts. They all pass through our heads. So I just want you to hold on to that as we go on. So that's as deep as we're going to get. So we're thinking about actual, the nature of thought itself. Yeah, that's a deep, 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 deep concept. But hey, there are so many things coming at you guys just now. Some of you have already been sharing in the chat box some of the things that are on your mind. And let us know what is on your mind just now. There's a wee window into my last week, not just in terms of myself, but in people that I was coaching and working with. And I've heard everything in this last week from job worries, people really frustrated, people's fatigue in school and out of school, their levels of exhaustion, teachers responding to things that ordinarily wouldn't phase them have suddenly become maybe a bit of a nuclear incident or a bit fractious, people really worried about their jobs, so many different factors and issues. And I would love to know what it is that's on your minds tonight as you are listening to what we are saying. Cameron, what, you know, is going through your head in terms of things that you're facing and grappling with at the moment, just generally? Well, just to echo what a couple of the people said in the, the, the chat box, when this first um, came into play and we first became aware that this was going to be an issue, I was very much of the opinion that it would just be that initial three weeks I was working on a play. I was given some time away from River City to work on a play about a year ago now. And on the Monday of the first day of rehearsal, which would have been two weeks before the lockdown, we were talking about this virus that you were sort of hearing about. And we, were thought, we were thinking about what a lot of rubbish that it was. Like with people were overreacting, which I saw someone else writing in the, the group chat, just that people were thinking that it was far much of a, a, a thing than what it actually was. And I actually went to a football match that Thursday evening and with like 52,000 people. Um, and there was just signs up about coronavirus. And it did feel at that moment and when they started shutting down different um, sporting events that it was becoming slightly more serious. And on that Tuesday, the following Tuesday, I was told within 20 minutes of one another that the play at the Oran Moor and River City had shut down. So straight away, we didn't know what financial support we were going to get. Um, so straight off the bat, you were obviously worried again, going back and echoing some of the remarks in the the, the chat box about you know financial stability the sustainability of of your work as a whole and it's something that's sort of been ever present since that because even when we were fortunate enough to get back to river city we've had to reduce the episodes down to half an hour there's only a certain amount of people that can be in the building at a time and you're just getting to wonder about how sustainable this all actually can be and with the rules that are now in place how that's affected the actual filming of the show we can't be within two meters of one another and all things like that so you do get worried about what sort of ramifications that's going to have. Obviously, with being self-employed, you're worried about all the time about paying your mortgage. Um, and that's not even taking into consideration the added thing of everyone here having, you know, a family to to um, provide for. So I can only imagine the sort of stress and anxiety levels that all these people that have joined us here tonight have had to, had, had to go through. Um, so I think it's ultimately the most important thing and hopefully the, the only thing or one of the things that people take away from this is that you're not alone. I've said before that this is probably the one moment and certainly our generation that everyone in the world is going through the same thing. So if you want to latch on to a glimmer of hope through this horrible situation is that there probably wasn't, a, there probably hasn't been a better time for you to reach out and get advice from someone because they're going through the same thing. They can help you with experiences that they've had, thoughts that they've had, st stressy, anxiety thoughts that have came in and triggers for that as well. So all these, um, you know, come out of things and all these factors can ultimately lead to a little bit of um, help from people because, like I say, it's the one situation that the full of the world has been affected by. Um, so I think that it's important to, to reach out and hopefully, like I say, latch on to a glimmer of hope that perhaps now is the best time that we've ever had to, to really get some um, helpful advice and, and guidance from just those people around about us that we reach out to. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's lovely advice. And for yourself, Leanne, what's kind of shifted? I mean, Leanne, you're <laughs> the world's busiest person. What has shifted <laughs> for you 
you know, in terms of changes to your life and that you're comfortable enough for sharing? Is there anything coming yeah, to mind? So, I mean, on the, the kind of maybe the more negative side, I've, I've not probably moved from this desk in almost a year. Mm -hmm. but, um, I, we can uh, meet my I just started a new job funnily enough at the beginning of March and wow. like that two weeks into it we were hearing this story about coronavirus and I actually remember sitting cracking jokes with my colleague about hand sanitizer and not being Absolutely. able to hear it and I'm like this is ridiculous thinking oh for goodness sake get over it and then we get told that we had to start working from home about mid-March, and that has been me. I've, I've not moved from this desk since. But on the positive side, there's been things like I'm, I'm now uh, coming up to celebrating my second lockdown birthday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So last year when we uh, when I did have it, um, my friends organised the, the, the Zoom birthday, which mm -hmm. now I've Gotten used to, and in actual fact, in years gone by, trying to get all, all of us on a night out together was normally quite difficult because everybody would make excuses. I'm too busy, I'm double booked, I'm too tired, and you'd be lucky to maybe get two out of the eight of us. But on that Zoom, we were all on it because it, nobody was going anywhere. I think we were all looking for some sort of socializing. So, if anything, um probably while I'm not seeing people face to face, there's been a bit more contact with people mm -hmm. um, because maybe people are reassessing their priorities. Maybe people have got more time as well to devote to their friendships. Um, mm -hmm. And the same with the group. We were ready to pack up our bags with Glasgow City Parent Group last February because the engagement levels were next to nothing. Then lockdown happened, the schools closed, we started sharing information and our engagement levels went through the roof. And now we've discovered that all this technology and going online actually really works for us because it's a lot more accessible for parents and carers to get online and listen to all this useful information but not having to worry about a babysitter or travelling to a, a venue that might be miles away or um, rushing home for work and not having dinner and, and getting back out again to make it. Um, so at least then, like everybody on here tonight, I'm sure these are probably kicking back on your couch, maybe with your jammies on. Um, <laughs> kids are running about for a list of this. Um, it's only us that need to have tidied up our living room and, and put our makeup on. <laughs> yeah, that's why you're facing my back wall. You don't know the state of the air there. <laughs> so, if there's plus and minuses to the whole situation, Situation, I guess I keep trying to look more at the, the pluses of it rather than dwelling in the, the negatives. Absolutely. <laughs> totally. And actually, you're right. That's such an important point that you're making that we our optimism, and we'll talk a wee bit more about that as well, uh, because there's loads of positives that have happened to this. Um, there's a few uh, I'm getting slightly positively heckled from uh, some people that are very dear to me down the road in sunny Inverclyde. Yeah. Hugh Scott, the manager of uh, Inverclyde's Youth Services, and Michelle, um, I used to work with them both, and, and they're amazing people, actually. But, you know, that's, um, I don't I have no idea what I was going to say. I'm so, so just wallowing in nostalgia there, the fact that, um, yeah, there's lots and lots of positive, sorry, in lockdown. And we can, as Leanne was saying, really focus in on the negatives. And I suppose what I'm appealing for here is, well, can we control our thinking? Can you actually control the thoughts that are going through your head? In the chat box, let us know just now your immediate response. Can you control what you are thinking in the chat box and give us any examples if you can let's have a bit of debate and discussion around this um let us know what you think can you actually control thought itself because if we're all having these 50 to 80 thousand thoughts a day going through our heads there's a lot of thinking going on there there's positive thinking, there's negative thinking, probably for some of us, a lot of overthinking as well. So I'd be curious, team, let me know 
your responses to that? Can you actually control thoughts? That is the big, deep question. And we've got a few responses coming in. Somebody's suggesting that you can control how you respond to it. Interesting way of phrasing that. Thanks for sharing that one with us as well. Keep your responses coming. What do you think? Um, Kate's saying before COVID, you would have said yes, but since COVID, you're less sure. Interesting how that's maybe had an impact. Sarah, to a certain extent, yes, but you can't control what's going through your mind. We've got Dorothy again at the start of lockdown. You did a mindfulness course mm -hmm. and it saved you from going mad. We'll talk about mindfulness and I think it's brilliant and has a lot to offer. Absolutely. And um, Diane, you can't control how you cope or deal with your thoughts. It's amazing the range of opinions that we've all mm -hmm. got here. Gary, Gary, I love your point. You think it's circumstantial, Gary. I love that. Um, definitely. Um, although a bit of a politician's answer potentially as well. We may see you at the Scottish Parliament, although we better not, we better not go there just now, given that the world is uh, imploding there as well. Kathleen, you're saying you can to a degree as you can choose what you watch, read and talk about, but there's many factors you can't. Keep your responses coming in, team. But I tell you what, um, I think you're fit for this. Let's try a thought experiment, me broadcasting from my... Uh, sell here in sunny Kelvin Bridge to you guys spread out across the country and a huge wad of you in the central belt as it should be. So for the next 10 seconds, I am going to ask you all to literally have zero thoughts. So close your eyes. I'm going to time it and your time starts now. and open up your eyes. I was so tempted. To, I, we, we've just come off a session with some young people and I kept doing this to them. <laughs> just to absolutely disturb them. I was going to just do that and hide down there and see if you all noticed. So in the chat box, let us know, did you have zero thoughts? Or if a random thought came into your head and keep it clean it's still before the watershed, let us know what the thought was that popped randomly into your heads. Um, Leanne, did, um, did you manage to... Empty your head or what was going on? I knew you were going to ask me. No, <laughs> what I found, what I was doing was I was counting the 10 seconds down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. So that was thinking in itself, wasn't it? <laughs> Carly, what happened to you? Yeah, I managed it for a couple of seconds and then I felt like a flicker go on. So I was like, is somebody in my house? Is my leg about to go off? Have I paid my power card? So no. <laughs> right, so a couple a couple of fails out, and I had no chance because I was timing things and I was thinking about the screen and I was thinking about what I was going to say next and I was thinking about uh, everything else. But let's let's see what everyone has been coming up with. Kathleen, Kathleen was busy counting down. Tracy was thinking about not thinking. Sarah was <laughs> humming not just a song, just hmm. Very specific, Sarah. I'm loving it. Uh, Kate, no lots of thoughts about other people were managing from joining in. Um, yeah. Cyan, or I pronounced your name probably wrongly, my sincere apologies, but you were saying no zero thoughts, mine is resilience, so you're thinking about role development and deadlines. Yeah, totally, this stuff seeps in. Tam, interesting that you were concentrating on the colours in the front of your eyes, that, yeah, thinking about black and seeing black as a way of trying to, to empty your head. I mean... Yeah, loads and loads of different responses. Some of you, interestingly, who are more steeped in mindfulness practice, well, I found that exercise easier. And then there's lots of us who would have just had all of these thoughts. I think unless you're steeped in the art of deliberate practice and, and being present in the moment and mindfulness, that you would struggle to be able to absolutely control your thinking. But I actually think that what we can do is shift and to a degree influence our thinking. And as people were saying earlier, somebody made the really astute point that 
We can influence our responses to our thinking. And I want to explore this a wee bit with you just now. Imagine that it's just after lockdown is lifted. And my goodness, there's a positive set of scenarios to be imagining. And we're nearly, nearly there, team. So hold your nerve. But imagine that you are in the middle of your street and you're walking down it. And you see your best pal that you've not seen since the start of the pandemic. And they're on the other side of the road. And you shout and you wave and you scream and you jump. And you're trying to attract their attention. And they ignore you. And they keep on walking past you. In the chat box, let me know what is your first response to what has happened there in that wee bit of that scenario that I've given you. What are you thinking? What is your response to that situation? First instinctive thought that popped into your head. Share it in the chat box. I want to know what happened for you in that scenario. Um, Cameron, any kind of immediate responses to that? Yeah, uh, whenever I think that, it, my first reaction is always, what have I done? Uh, what have I done to upset them? Is it something that I've, uh, you know, been sort of subconsciously done, not realised that would have upset them? Have I, maybe, I don't know, with the sort of situation that we find ourselves in at the moment, have I tweeted something that would upset them? Did they text me? I have no text back. It would always be completely uh, inverted on me. The spotlight wouldn't shift to anyone else. I would never mm-hmm. think that, uh, my initial thought anyway wouldn't be like, oh, are they having a bad day? Is it something to do with them? It would always be um, a negative slight on me. Like, oh, I, I must have done something to upset them. Otherwise, why would they, you know, ignore me and react in that fashion? So it's certainly a, a negative um, sort of mindset that I find myself in in that situation for sure. I know that that's exactly the way that that would play out for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Leanne, did you have the same or was it different or? For me, probably instantly I would be, cursing them in my head so I wouldn't repeat <laughs> what I'd be saying but then it would probably be a few hours later when I'm at home then I'd start thinking about it and start mm-hmm. thinking about the reaction and start going hold on that wasn't normal what's mm-hmm. going on here? and then I'd maybe start going to the way Cameron was thinking but at first mm-hmm. I'd, I'd kind of think well I, I can deal with that and I'd move <laughs> on and, and that would be it but then it's the, the thoughts start creeping in yeah, and that's when I start going right hold on that wasn't right yeah, yeah, totally. And again, look, it just shows you even the range of responses. And that's nothing compared to what's going down in the chat right now. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, John Brawley wins the award for a Scottish term of the year. And it's just one word from John. John has just said it as he sees it. And it's numpty. I don't know if that's a reflection on me or or what his response is to his best pal ignoring him across the road. But others are saying things like they didn't see me. I was deflated that they're struggling with life. Fiona's saying OMG. Um, Claire is saying that they were lost in their own thoughts. And interestingly, Diane stepping back and thinking, hope she's okay. Lisa, Why? Um, Michelle Scott, have I aged that much? Listen, lockdown has done many things to all of us. I am starting to look like Jabba. Uh, I do not care about it either. Um, But that's really interesting. And what I want to unpick with you, I suppose, is for those of you that did do a wee bit of what Cameron uh, was suggesting there and thinking, what have I done wrong? Mm -hmm. Thinking that it was you that was at fault that straight kind of going in to absolute pessimism. And what I would say to you is that we are actually wired for pessimism to an extent. It is a bit of a default position that is in our DNA. It was in our DNA from prehistoric times. Um, and no, I wasn't around then, but I am starting to, to look like it. But imagine... You are that cave person coming out of your cave in prehistoric times. And you're going foraging for food. And behind you, unbeknown to you, there's a massive bear with its claws ready to pounce and make you its dinner. Is that a time 
for Lego Movie, Everything is Awesome, Joy Joys, and Attempting to Dance with the Bear? Or is it a time when the adrenaline kicks in and you run for survival, that fight or flight instinct? Now, that is wired in for to us for reasons of our survival. But when you are in the middle of Buchanan Street in Glasgow doing your shopping and have that surge in 2021 of thought and the same kind of responses with your heart rate going up, and sometimes you might not even know what has triggered this. These responses are less than helpful. And actually, for teachers in the classroom, for youth workers, of which there are a few on uh, the chat just now as well, we see this in terms of it's a, a bit of a presentation of, of a trauma response. And teachers will see more of that across our classrooms across the country. So... We're wired for pessimism to an extent. And the only reason I'm telling you that is so that you can be aware of your thinking. And let us know in the chat box, do you think you are naturally optimistic or are you naturally pessimistic? And does what we are saying ring true for you and your experience at the moment? Let us know in the chat box. Because I think then... If you're in a situation where you find yourself doing a lot of negative thinking, lots and lots of overthinking, maybe take that step back and think through, is there another way I could be looking at this situation? Is there a way I could step back and be a bit more curious about what's going on? So not jumping in with both feet and having the response to the situation, but taking that step back and thinking, I wonder what else is happening. Like Diane was saying earlier, I wonder if that person is okay. I wonder if I should reach out. Do they need my help? Is there more that I could do? Rather than responding just with the raw emotion. But I'd love to know what you guys are all thinking. A few of you are saying that uh, what your responses are as well. Keep your chat coming. We are absolutely loving it. So in terms of a wee bit of some things for you to think about at home, what our children need in terms of their well-being and their resilience is in fact very, very similar to what we require as adults. And the theory about resilience and well-being is quite clear. So we all need a sense of self-worth. Think about it at school, at college, at your work, at uni, whatever your walk of life. You need to feel valued. You need to feel appreciated. So that rings true for our children as well. But the other bit that they absolutely need from us, and that this has been probably a challenge in loads of our houses across the country, but consistent routines and consistency of behaviour from us. So by consistent routines, and I know minds are all over the place in terms of shifting uh, kind of bedtimes extending, you know, December bleeding into January. I'm not entirely sure what one is now as I'm standing in front of you. But there is a real need. Our children need that and our teenagers need that consistent routine and us to model that. But what our children need, just like we need, is people to acknowledge the struggle your kids need from you just now to that acknowledgement that things are really, really challenging and really, really difficult. But within that, the need for us to model optimism, hope, but hope based on their reality. So in our work with teachers, in our work with school leaders at the moment, in our work with pupils, we work really hard to model this. Cameron and I will always go in and try and be as positive as we can, but we're as honest as we can about the challenges, about the situations that we are absolutely in. And it's important that, that we have those types of conversations with our own kids as well. 
Leanne, is, what's your thinking? Like, are you a bit of this ringing true in terms of the, the little darlings in the house or the not so little darlings? What, what's your take? Oh, just, just the one not so little darling in my house. <laughs> um, the, the routine is definitely the thing for us. My daughter, even when she was a toddler, was always liked her routine. So dinner was always like a set time and we'd always sit at the table. And I think because I'd kind of built that routine into her. So that's what she's kind of struggled with most. So I've tried to keep that routine where, I mean, I, I'm getting up still every day and doing my work. And actually a couple of weeks ago um, to kind of hopefully give her a positive role model. Um, I was going on meetings in my hoodie and no makeup all the time and I didn't, hopefully I look a bit more glamorous tonight, but I didn't always look like this. <laughs> and I, I felt like a couple of weeks ago, she was kind of doing the same thing, not wanting to get out of bed, mm -hmm. not wanting to get changed out of jammies. So I actually told myself a few weeks ago, right, do you know what, Leanne? From now on, if you've got meetings online, you're going to get up, you're going to put on, and I have, I'm sitting here with like smart trousers on and my blouse that I would wear to work, and my heels actually. Brilliant. Put makeup on, and I'm going to start acting like I am getting up and fully working, and and I think it has had a wee bit of effect on her, because mm -hmm. the last couple of days, she's got up, she's got showered, she's got dressed, she's not going anywhere. But she's get dressed and then she's logging on her iPad and getting her school work done. So yeah, the routine is definitely a big thing in this house. We we like our routine. We like to know where we're we're at for day to day. Totally. <laughs> that's that's actually, that thing as well is uh, leading by example. It's um that age old thing that anything is just a sum of its parts. So in order to help any anyone else, you need to be the best version of yourself that you possibly can be. Uh, especially with the younger people that um you know are going to be looking on. And they're living through this really strange time and they're, they're always looking to the, the adults in their life for guidance and support and how to, you know, cope with these things. So in order to, like I say, help anyone else, being the best version of yourself is the best start point. And obviously yourself, Leanne, is just living proof of that. So that's brilliant. Just not always as easy to be the adult. <laughs> go. I don't want to be the adult today. <laughs> a role reversal. You should try that one day, see how that pans out. <laughs> Not sure. I'll that risk. I'll be uh, <laughs> chips of Smarties and a bowl of milk for your breakfast and all that. That'd be good. And the other bit that was really interesting, what you were saying there, Leanne, was the point about, like, there's loads of things you can actually control just now, but the decision to get dressed and the decision to set things at a certain time is that wee bit about actually taking control and and actually that the research tells us in terms of the way that uh, we work and, and the link with mental health and depression where people become more prone to depression is when they feel that they've lost the locus of control so the more that you can actually take wee steps even if they are just wee steps that can make a, an absolutely huge difference to our, our well-being as well and there's some really interesting points in the chat box coming up as well. Um, you know, um, something that, and there's a point I really want to go about. Yeah, Catherine, your point. You're saying that your 15-year-old son is struggling with his self-esteem just now. And the school support teacher has said that he needs to study more and he needs to try harder. He needs to speed up as he's got uh, exams coming up and he's suffering with high anxiety and this doesn't help. Um, absolutely. What, um, and, and Catherine, it is about getting into to dialogue and using your relationships with the school or empowering your son to do that. My take on it for what this is worth from working with schools across the country, the educational recovery piece is a wee bit like our national deficit just now in terms of the bank balance. Any attempt to try and repair that by June isn't quite going to work. This is a longer term kind of situation that we're in. And teachers will be wanting their pupils to do well, as we all do. But a lot of that is actually about our anxiety about getting them compared to and doing uh, comparing against a standard of a normal academic school year. As far as I'm concerned, as long as kids are engaging as much as they can, trying as much as they can, you're trying to do what you can to hold the space for them and support and encourage. 
then as long as they're safe and as long as they're well and as long as they're loved and as long as they're supported, then when they get back to school, and there will be lots of learning taking place, that recovery piece will come. So he needs to hold his nerve. Teacher needs to hold the nerve and, and you as well. And I appreciate how, how difficult that and challenging that is. Um, but the educational recovery bit will absolutely come over time. The way we do things um, from here on in needs to be kind of fundamentally kind of different as well. The one thing that's amazing, and this is why we were so keen to do this tonight with, with Leanne and with all of you, the relationships between parents and schools, I think, are in the most amazing, for the most part, the most amazing place ever because you guys are working together You've found your voice. You are leaning in. You've got the direct mechanisms in and the routes into school. I appreciate schools are all very, very different across the country. But, guys, you're not backwards and coming forwards and putting forwards what needs to change, what needs to happen. And there are different ways of doing things. Um, you know, in the first lockdown, I was coaching some teaching staff in uh, it was around about March last year. And a, a group of teachers that have been teaching for 20 years, John Paul, I'm not doing, I'm not doing any live lessons. Can't do it. Can't absolutely do it. All right. Why? Tell me your objections. You know, is it a wee bit nervous or a bit anxious? No. A parent might hear me. I was like, what? There's an amazing chance to shine and to show what you're doing and the miracles that you're working in, in the classroom. And a lot of them have gotten over that as well. So, yeah, they've got a lot of anxiety and a lot of stuff going on as well. So, yeah, big appeal there for people to hold their nerve. Now, folks, I just want to hurtle through some top tips for well-being uh, that I think will make a difference and more of a reminder for all of you to be focusing on. But, and we've had a wee bit of a chat about this earlier, that relationship with mindfulness, being present in the moment, practicing bits of meditation, using apps like Headspace and Calm on your devices, although you don't need a device to practice mindfulness. But we would, I would urge you to explore working on that, being aware of your thinking, as we have been chatting a lot about tonight. But the other critical bit to all of this just now, and hopefully with the weather slightly improving, he says, fingers crossed, is a relationship with exercise. We are all spending far too much time in front of screens, as Leanne was saying earlier about that wall-to-wall -wall Zoom. So getting out for 30 minutes, getting out for a breather, getting out for your exercise is absolutely critical. And somebody once said, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. So get wrapped up, even if it's howling outside, and get some air, get some exercise. That relationship with our mental well-being and the creation of endorphins that are created through exercise. Vitamin D on the two times a year that we actually see the sun in Scotland can be hugely beneficial for us as well. But the other thing in this is, what are you doing for yourself that is about your creativity? Not your works, not your school children's homeschooling. What about you? What are you doing that is just for you? In the chat box, let us know what talents, what creative things have you been doing or could you be doing? And the reason I'm asking is not just to be nosy, but there's a proven link with our mental well-being and actually being engaged in creative pursuit. So what could you be planning to do post-lockdown? Or what have you been managing to do? Now, Cameron, I know for a fact that you've been doing something. I don't know if you kept it up. You did tell me this ages ago. But you've got a random uh, creative pursuit. Well, you've got two, actually. And I don't know if you remember what the other one is. But what's coming to your mind? My ukulele. Yes! Oh, yes. And then uh, is the other one building my dens? Aye. Right. So tell us about these things. Yeah, so at the start of um, the, the initial lockdown, like I say, like uh, the, the two jobs that I was working on at the time um, obviously closed down as everything else did. And um, 
as both a child and an adult, I've always loved building dens. Like in my living room, we just like cut our bed sheets, get some fairy lights. I brought through loads of snacks, uh, decorated it with candles and stuff like that. And I also brought through a wee pot from the kitchen for like a makeshift ice cooler to put my fizzy water on my juice and something a bit stronger in it. Um, and had a, I had a lot of fun with that. So I spent a lot of time in the initial lockdown in my makeshift den in the living room, set up in such a way that you're away from the TV. So you brought in your laptop to create that cinematic experience. Um, so that was that was good. Just it was just a form of regression and just a form of you know soothing thoughts and calming yourself down. And I don't know if it was like uh, if it was sort of blocking out what was going on and staying away from the news. I didn't watch any news. I still don't watch any of the news. Um, and my ukulele. It was just something that I wanted to pass the time. I hadn't played any musical instruments before. Um, and, yeah, it's something that I really threw myself into. That being said, I, I, I've said before that I was all, I was very much against uh, something that I found quite prevalent during the first lockdown, whereby, again, spending too much time on uh, my social media at the time, I found that there were some people that were almost wanting people to maximize every single minute of the day whereby they have, they've learned five languages in a week or they've learned three musical instruments or they can do a backflip through their kitchen and I, I feel like sometimes it was sending sort of the wrong message whereby they were making people feel pressured into doing something whereas I was much more of the um the thought that if you were getting through and still am if you're if you're getting through the day you're doing more than enough like this is an, an unbelievable time that we're going through. You do not need to be putting the added pressure upon yourself to be maximizing every moment and learning seven skills a day, especially in this setting, obviously, with, with parents who have got so many different plates spinning. And I do, I've got a few very close friends that are um, parents and they were struggling with that. Like, oh, should I be teaching my kid as well as like the schoolwork, like new skills? Like, should I be uh, learning the musical instruments, learning how to do this, learning how to do that? And it's like, it was an unfair pressure to be putting on people just solely through social media and not really taking into consideration the different sort of circumstances that a, a, a multitude of people will find themselves in. Mm -hmm. um, so although I did have those sort of like creative outlets in myself, whereby I was building dens and um, uh, playing my ukulele and learning the ukulele, I don't think that um, people had to give themselves unnecessary pressure of doing stuff like that. It was just about getting through the day, and that's just how I chose to do it. Nice, nice. And and obviously you got a huge amount of kind of benefit out of all of that as well. Uh, it's brilliant. Absolutely. It's absolutely, absolutely amazing. And guys, folks, and uh, I've been sharing just the, the different range of pursuits and the different kind of benefits that they've got out of it. Tam, Tam is, Tam's brilliant. Uh, Tam plays in a band or a, an orchestra, but he's also saying there about his sourdough making Tom, I will give you my address and you can send Absolutely. as many samples of bakery and at well, Leanne's I also, can I also um, add that Tom is actual a um, magician as well. We had a no. quiz for Glasgow City Parents Group at our, our, Chris, like our December meeting. We did a Christmas quiz and Tam surprised us at the end with a bit of magic and blew our minds. That's well, if, Tam's a -making, if Tam's a sourdough making magician, I could certainly make one of his loafs disappear. <laughs> hey, very good. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, just a couple of more points for me. And then, I'm, then, folks, I want you to start to be thinking as well questions for Cameron, maybe about his mental health and well being and resilience journey. Or maybe you have got curiosity about his acting career and the challenges he's faced in terms of resilience and grit and determination. Or actually, you want to ask him about River City, which I believe is a soap opera. I'm going to get thumped by him. But so get your questions ready. Don't fire them in just now, but be ready. That is coming up in just a couple of minutes. But a few points I want you to think about. Firstly, is your device managing you? or are you managing it? It's just a question, and I'm not saying that devices are all bad, but think about the amount of notifications you're getting in a given day. Does every app that's vying for your attention need to summon you and shout on you and control you? Does your social media usage um, always make you feel better when you're on TikTok, Insta, Facebook, Snapchat, wherever you are at, do you come away from that always feeling positive? 
Or could you and indeed your kids be coming away from that feeling depressed, anxious, stressed, worried? Is there creeping into some of that? And these are just questions I'm posing for you, actually giving you a false idea of how well or otherwise everyone else is coping with their current situation. So if all you're seeing is happy families, happy puppies, happy dogs, happy holidays, everyone has got this except you. Well, that's what you could come away from social media thinking. Now, it's easier for us to keep that in perspective, I think, but not always as adults. I think our teenagers and our young people are going to need a bit of help. I think we've done a bit of a 360 with all of this. We spent the first up into the pandemic saying, get off your devices, stay off your device. Uh, it's family time. Remember the family. Hello, we're here. Now we've done a complete pivot. It's, and I don't know if this is happening in the Maguire house or not, get on your device, stay on that device, move off that device and that couch for the next seven hours and you are in deep trouble, yeah? So at some point we've given complete mixed messages, our device consumption, our screen time, all of these things have went through the roof. Maybe as a family, having a bit of a digital detox, putting the phones in the drawer for a couple of hours, that might... Again, choose your battles carefully. Is that going to create more angst than it's worth? Is that one for April and May as things are opening back up? Just something to think about. Your relationship with social media, the kids' relationship with their devices and their screen time and their social media as well. So manage your device and don't let it manage you. Now, a couple of things that I want you to just think about as well. If you're feeling really stressed, overwhelmed, anxious, and there's a lot going on that you think you absolutely can't control at the moment, and we know that there is, and we chatted about some of those issues that you guys are facing just now, but if you are finding yourself trapped in that cycle of overthinking, repetitive thinking, thinking about the same thing, over and over again. Get a sheet of paper. On the left-hand side, write down absolutely everything that you can't control that is making you anxious, that's on your mind. Get it all written down, a big mammoth list. On the right-hand side, write down all of the things that you can influence just now in your life that you can control. Things you can't control, the economy, redundancy, being worried um, about your job, um, the homeschooling, um, are they going to get caught up? There's loads of things in there that you simply haven't got any actual huge definitive control over. Things you can control, if you're facing redundancy or threat of redundancy and uncertainty, could you be doing bits of online training, bits of retraining, dusting down your CV? asking for help, getting onto LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. Just taking some tangible wee steps, you taking the power back and a bit of the control back and getting some of that influence back so that you feel that you're able to make a wee bit of progress with some of this. It's important that our kids are doing this and that they are goal-oriented in their lives and in their learning. But in terms of our mindset, our psychology and our well-being, Goal setting is really, really important. So I would urge you to think about that and focusing on the things that you can control. And in the chat box, let me know if that's chiming with you and if that's making sense in terms of your perspective. But the other thing in this is, now's the time to be asking for help and leaning in and connecting with each other. Somebody said earlier in the chat box, I think it was Diane, but I can't remember. Apologies, Diane, if it, if it was or if it wasn't, um, about we hope that we keep up this style of energy and communication and regard for each other um, as something after, you know, as a life lesson. Well, we absolutely wholeheartedly agree with that. I think it's something that we, we need to be doing. But ask for help if you're encountering deep struggle. Use the supports that you've got and you've got, you know, from a Glasgow perspective and across the country, your local parents groups are an amazing source 
of fellow travellers on the journey. So get in touch with Leanne and use the different groups across the country to build connections and so that you're not grappling with stuff on your own. Um, in terms of school, leaning on school, using guidance teachers, deputy heads, class teachers, building that connection if you've got worries and concerns about how your children are doing, absolutely use all of that. But in all of this just now, self-care is absolutely never selfish, right? So remember I said earlier about the kind of oxygen mask analogy. Um, there's a reason why they say apply your own oxygen mask before helping others in the event of a plane disaster. Uh, and by the way, who was it in the chat box that said they were watching Chernobyl to cheer themselves up? I was just thinking about disasters there, and I remember somebody in the chat having, having said that as well. But guys, I think it was, think it was more that they made them realize um, the good things, things in life. I don't think it was exactly. to cheer them up. Yeah, no, I was thinking that terrified me. I watched that drama, it absolutely terrified me. Man. But, <laughs> uh, totally. But the, um, were you in Chernobyl, Cameron? No. What, there or in the... No, no neither. <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you, didn't, you weren't in it somewhere? No, I'm just checking. Um, so in case I slag that and then get into deep, deep trouble, and I'm about to hear from you in just a second about your journey and your adventure. But, folks, you can't help your kids or your families or your friends if you're not taking good care of your own mental health and your own mental well-being. So get a plan from tonight. Take some steps, you know, um, Think about setting some goals for yourself. Think about exercise. Think about screen time. Think about all of the things, the wee steps that you could take some action on today that could just make a bit of a difference to where you are at. And let us know in the chat box what your goals and what your steps are going to be. So and that's my top tips for health and well-being so keep your chat coming and now folks let us know have you got any questions about anything you've heard that you want to direct to me or Leanne if you get questions about the, the Glasgow parents group and their work uh, and the work that Leanne's involved in or for Cameron in terms of the actor's life and River City. Now, for those of you that haven't seen River City, and we'll see if this works technologically, I have got a couple of seconds of Cameron in action. He will be mortified, but we'll see if we can get this to play. Not bad. I'm a vodka boy usually, but probably better than it, doesn't he? I could get used to that. <laughs> Why don't you stick around? Yeah, well, it was plain fine until just... you started until mm. you started speaking there. Do you mind if I uh, speak frankly, Mr. M? I insist. Dave. There we go. Dave's not the sharpest tool in the box. Always been a bit flaky. Go on the bevy or the gear or whatever. You wouldn't see him for days at a time. He'd be off in Amsterdam or something. Sounds like a solid guy. Hey. Dave's not the this is different. Box. Always been a bit flaky. This is getting on for two weeks and nothing, not a word. I can feel it in my gut that something's wrong. You know what I'm saying, right? I do. He's disappeared. Whoa, something's wrong, and we'll leave it on that cliffhanger. But I am, I keep forgetting that you are an actor and, again, becoming quite a famous actor, Cameron. Cameron. Infamous, I mean, maybe. <laughs> infamous, absolutely. I would love to hear questions for Cameron, please. And also, Cameron, like, you know, Kick us off. Talk us about what life is like in River City and what it's like in a pandemic. First and foremost, it's not lost on us at all, any of us, how dreadfully fortunate and lucky we are to be working, first and foremost. We feel so appreciative. We feel so lucky. And it, like I say, it's not lost on any of us. It is obviously different and it is obviously difficult. We've not. We're, we're, it's a BBC blanket rule that you can't be within two metres of anyone on set, anyone at all. There's been massive changes at a great financial um, payment from the show to, to put loads of different implications in place and change sets and things. Even still, there's still some sets that aren't big enough to incorporate the two metre distance from everyone. So there's very often that currently you're given, you're acting alongside 
literally a tennis ball on a stick, a tennis ball on a tripod. So this tennis ball on a tripod, like he's given some of the best performances I've ever seen in the show. Like BAFTA need to be right on the phone and he's the most used actor there at the moment. Um, he's brilliant. Uh, but uh, it is difficult. It's difficult not seeing cast members. Like there's some cast members that I'm really pally with. Stephen Purden, who fans of the show undoubtedly know, plays Bob. He's a good mate. I mean, I've not seen him in a year. Although we're in this show together, you've not you, you you're in a bubble in work, so you're with the people that you work with, and you they call you in only when you're needed. You're not allowed to hang around afterwards, which you used to always be able to do. You can't sit in the canteen together. You don't share a dressing room with anyone anymore. So it's quite an, it's quite a lonely place to be now, River City. That being said, obviously the the overriding thing is like I've said, we're unbelievably lucky to work full stop like we'll never ever um slight on it like we're working and that's brilliant but there is obviously some changes and it's it's just a bit sad compared comparing to what it was like i was only there for like a couple of months before this started um it's only got to it's 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 not as much of a change for me i've, I've been in river city longer in a pandemic than what i have not um one thing i will say is that we are so grateful to the audience to, for sticking with us because some of the dramas, it's difficult to sort of give when you can't throw each other over a pool table or you can't have a, you, you can't give, um, you can't portray romantic storylines in the way of like physical contact or anything like that. So it does become difficult. You can't have any more than two people generally in a scene. So to have the audience stick with us is unbelievable and we're so thankful for the support. And yes, I gush over River City, as you know, mate. Like, I, I love it. I feel so lucky. And um, it's, a, it's a really wonderful place to be filled with amazing people. And I'm just so thankful that we get to still do it for the audience that really deserve it. Amazing. And there's a few folk in the chat box who are uh, fans as well. Karen, uh, she loves Tyler in River City. Well done, Cameron. Fantastic actor Thank and you, program. Uh, I think Angela was saying that she loves it as well. So she Thank flicked you. over from Chernobyl to River City, <laughs> and that definitely cheered <coughs> her up. Sorry, Angela, I'm picking you. You can get me back uh, some other time <laughs> as well. Susan had some random researchers turn up at her house to look at what an ideal tenement looks like when they were researching uh, setting up River That's City good. as well. Yeah, yeah, it's quite, quite, quite random as well. Can I just I, say, I, I don't watch River City normally, but it was on in the background last night because I'd obviously not turned the channel over. So, <laughs> but one thing that made me laugh was I probably would never have taken any notice of it, but when I, mm. I, I suddenly heard the name Parlor Folks in the background, <laughs> I went, oh, oh, I know that name. I don't know that name. Aye, <laughs> I, I know it's a, it's a standout <laughs> name. For Anna, you. But people were talking about you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Aye, they're often talking about me. It gets a bad rep, the poor wee guy. Called a, called a wee naff and all that. It gives me a bit of complex sitting watching it. <laughs> And your journey into acting, Cameron, wasn't straightforward, or it started off quite easy, so you thought, and then it went off in a bit of a different direction. Do you want to just tell folk very quickly about some of that journey and some of the lessons you learned from it? I think it's fascinating. Yeah, well, it's a bit of a mouthful, but I'll try and give you the bridge version looking at the time. So I, I always wanted to be a police officer, and I left uh, school at the end of fourth year because I, I was going to police cadets. I was moving up to Tilly Allen to be in the police cadets. The banks crashed in 2008, and one of the first things to be scrapped was the police cadet program. So I'd left my, I'd left school, got a letter through the door summer holiday saying, yeah, that's not happening, mate. So I went back to school. I had to go down to the school in the summer holidays, Erdrick Academy, and fill out my option form for my hires. Took higher drama because I thought it was going to be a skive and a good laugh. And uh, my drama teacher at the time, Stacey Dunn, um, who I'm still in contact now with, she's a, a tremendous teacher and had a massive effect on me in a positive way. She thought I was all right at it, thought I should apply to drama schools. I thought that was mental. Acting wasn't a job. I'm just here to have a laugh. That's crazy. I've never been to audition before in my life. And she said, well, actually, I've heard that there's an open audition for a film happening in Glasgow. So why don't you go along just to get experience, just to see what an audition's like? So I did just for a laugh to see what it was like. And I ended up getting the part. And it was for uh, Peter Mullins Neds about 10 years ago. So then I went from that straight into a film with Channing Tatum and Jamie Bell called The Eagle. And I was, what, 17 years old. So I thought, God, this acting thing's a total skush, man. Like, I'm going to be a superstar. Um, I get, working with Channing Tatum with my second job, working with Peter Mullen in my first job. Um, so then just went to sort of college, uh, got a scholarship to go over to New York, went and studied there for a little while, and then came back got my agent and then thankfully touch with 
um, just been working consistently ever since, really. That's amazing, absolutely amazing. And, you know, your grit and resilience and determination has been tested, you know, in this last year. The actor's life moving from having income to having huge pockets and months with zero income as well. So just very quickly, what are you using to keep yourself going at the moment that folk could maybe take uh, some inspiration from? Massive on meditation. I'm massive on meditation. I like to take time out to to try and squeeze that in at any time. Um, I'm a keen walker, go out, walks for hours and hours and hours. I've got my ukulele in my dens and things like that. Um, I talk to family when I can. Like I'm in a different health board for my family, so I can't go see them. Um, I've had two wee nephews born um, during lockdown, so uh, FaceTiming them when I can, along with my, my wee niece, Emily. So Emily, Leo and Shay have been tremendous sources of, of positivity and light and optimism for me. Um, although I've not really had time to, to spend with Leo and Shay since I've been born, which is obviously sort of heart-wrenching, um, just knowing that they're all right and knowing that my sister and my stepsister are looking after them tremendously well as their partners are as well, of course. Um, so just taking time to really um, appreciate the little things, as cheesy as that sounds. Um, I, 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 I like to just try and remain positive as, as best I can. Do have your bad days where obviously you're worrying about bills and things like that. But again, I'm on the lucky boat where I can go out um, and, and work, thankfully, for the you know the different changes that have happened in the River City and BBC taking such tremendous care of us. Um, but ultimately, the sustainability of the creative industry is taking a massive hit. And t- uh, having people down in London tell you to just go retrain and stuff doesn't really help, but <laughs> stay away from politics. Um, so, yeah, it can, it can be difficult. But, um, yeah, I, I think that ultimately, just like well, everything's been so tremendously generous in the chat box with giving everything that's helping with them, um, whether it be creative stuff, you know, taking breaks and screen, screen time, exercising as best you can, just utilising any sort of things that you have, any... Um, tools that you've got around about you and of course my work with teach mindset and yourself has um been a great source of um help as well and just keeping yourself focused and trying to help people as best you can and being open and honest about the trials and tribulations that you're undoubtedly going to go through mm-hmm, totally and you've brought so much energy to your work and your contact with young people and i always draw huge inspiration from you and you're you are a, a, an absolute pleasure to work with guys okay, that yeah, is another mora. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Don't take switch or checks. Uh, switch. I'm showing my age now. Um, folks, that is the end of this bit of the session. Um, before I hand over to Leanne for to kind of just finish up, one of the things I would say to you is if anyone wants to get in touch with us, do ping us an email. Um, John Paul at teachmindset.com. We are on Twitter at teachmindset and on Tinder web at all the bubble use dot teachmindset.com and we would love to hear from you. Cammy and I are also in the throes of getting ready to do a podcast, mainly on the grounds that I've discovered I've got a face for radio. So we will be uh, letting you all know about that if you want to hear more of Cammy and ours witty banter with other random guests. And I'm pretty sure Leanne's booked uh, pretty, one of the top five spots in there, Cammy. Yeah, think? I quite right, absolutely. I, I think so. <laughs> totally. if I, if I, <laughs> you know, no, you're not going to be busy because I think you're a natural. So, folks, I just want to thank all of you. Keep doing what you're doing, leaning in and connecting with each other. Keep supporting each other. Um, keep asking your children and those that are in your lives, how they're doing and get beyond the Scottish thing of fine and then ask them a follow-up question and how you're really doing. Lean in, connect, support each other. You have absolutely got this. And on that note, I am now handing over to Leanne. Thanks, John Paul. Well, first of all, thank you to John Paul and Cameron for answering my email when I contact them saying, I'm going to come and get involved with us so really appreciative of that I think it's been great tonight um it's been lovely to see all the comments in the chat as well and can I just say as well that even though we do say Glasgow City Parents Group I'm not that precious about it if you're not from (laughs) Glasgow and you want to contact me to ask me a question about schools and education 
I might not be able to guide you exactly of your local authority, but I can certainly point you in the right direction or, or help you out with some advice, hopefully. Um, and a lot of our events as well, they're not just Glasgow specific. So please don't be put off by the Glasgow. We're not that scary. Um, and we are a wee bit more inclusive <laughs> than you would think. So um, please do follow us on social media and we will continue as a group to supply events like this to parents and carers across the country, hopefully, that will be of use to you and be supportive to you and ultimately be supportive to your child, which is all what we want. So thank you again for joining us and hopefully we'll see you at some future events. Great. Take care of yourselves. Have a good night. Stay safe and get in touch with us if you want us in your school as well. Awesome. Let Thanks your head teachers know. Tonight. Take Bye. care, team. See you later. Keep the heat. <laughs> Keep the heat, indeed. Absolutely.